All right, I believe that we're going live here. <clears throat> Good uh, morning, everyone. It's August the 1st at uh, 1130. This is Pastor Smith of First Gospel Church. It's good to be with uh, everyone this morning. Um, I'm going to give it a few minutes for letting people get on. And uh, we'll get started with our morning Bible study. Those of you who do not know that we did not have church today, uh, it's because that we had... Uh, we had four different funerals uh, that the church was involved with yesterday, and we had several people out in these big crowds, and we already have found out this morning that some were exposed to COVID and didn't know it until today. And so <clears throat> I had decided to cancel service uh, just to protect the people. And... Uh, I'm just going to tell you, saints, I, I would be careful if it were me about going and getting a bug amount, uh, among large groups and large crowds unless it's absolutely necessary. I'd be careful about taking my children around that because COVID's bad right now and uh, <clears throat> people are being exposed to it and, and people are getting it. And just because you've got vaccines, uh, <clears throat> there are people with the vaccine that is that is also getting it. Also, if you're ex if you've had the vaccines, they say, and you've been exposed, you can expose others and not get it yourself. You can carry it for a few days if you've been exposed. So, so anyway, just a, a word of t a warning, you know, to just try to. I'm just trying to help the church and be careful as I can. You know, we're not, you know, I wanted to have our Wednesday night services start up again the first Wednesday of of um, oh, uh, July. And uh, <laughs> then we had the, the this spike. Uh, it was real bad in Missouri, and, and it was coming down in northern Arkansas. Of course, it's here now, the, the variant, the COVID variant, Delta, the Delta variant, which is more uh, contagious than regular COVID, we understand. People are getting fairly, it's different. It's, people are getting pretty sick with it. So, <clears throat> um Anyway, just a word of caution to everyone. I would be careful right now about getting around a lot of crowds. My thoughts on Wednesday night has been that um, we're, uh, you know, Little Rock is a, is a large metroplex, and there's a lot of people here, and people, of course, are working during the week. So my thought has been that if you're working and around a lot of people during the week, if you were to to be exposed to COVID, you more than likely would know by the weekend if you if you're if you've got COVID, and uh, a lot more than you would on weekends because on weekends you normally everybody's home, and so if you don't have it by Friday, well then the chances are better that you're not going to have it in church Sunday, but Wednesday. You've been around a lot more people, a lot more public. And so that's why I have refrained from having Wednesday night services until this thing slows down. And I have put it off indefinitely now with this new surge. And we'll just have to wait and see how things go. But um, uh, anyway, I hope everyone understands that I'm just trying to be cautious and careful and to protect our people. Uh, as much as I can. We've been so fortunate. We haven't had, like, you know, uh, we've just been fortunate. We're not better than anybody else, but we, you know, so far, we haven't had an outbreak of COVID in our church. And so I'm very thankful for that, you know. And um, But anyway, uh, today I was, and I'm going to tell everyone, um, 
I would like for everyone to download, if you don't have it, the Zoom app, either on your phone, your tablet, or your computer. Uh, Thursday night, we will, instead of me broadcasting Thursday night, uh, in fact, I was going to do this today, but I decided, no, it's, you know, it'd be better to wait till Thursday night. So Thursday night, we'll have a Zoom meeting, and I'm planning on having Zoom meetings on Thursday nights from now on rather than Facebook broadcast meetings. We can post them, I guess, on, uh, I'll have to talk to Brother Painter about that, but I'm pretty sure we, they can be posted to our Facebook page as well as our uh, YouTube page. Our YouTube page is uh, FGCLR dot media. That's the name of our YouTube page. FGC stands for Full Gospel Church LR Little Rock. FGCLR Full Gospel Church Little Rock dot media. That's our uh, YouTube page and, and our broadcast are all on there in chronological order. I'm going to on the Zoom meetings now. We, we can post those to uh, YouTube as well, but also I do record them and I can send the recording to anyone that wants it. Someone just let me know, uh, you know, I'd like to have that recording. I can just send you that recording and, and you know, it's just a link and you touch that link and it'll just play exactly the Zoom meeting that we had. So <clears throat> with all that said, uh, and uh, no further ado, we'll, I'd like for everyone to turn to Daniel, the ninth chapter. I want to talk a little bit about Daniel. Uh, uh, I probably won't have time or get into talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel, but I'm, I'm thinking about talking on that and teaching that, that subject. It's a great a mystery in the Bible, and uh, not very many people are, uh, especially in religion, not very many people are aware of, of uh, ex the explanation of the 70 weeks of Daniel, or either that or they're confused on it. Anyway, I I'd like to look at uh, Daniel's writing here, Dan Daniel's, the ex uh, information about Daniel. Um, in the ninth chapter of um, the book of Daniel, first verse. And uh, I, I will tell you this, I have, you can, um, I, have, I have figured out how to screen share on Facebook, but it does not work good. I, I, I don't like it at all. You can't go back and forth. On Zoom, I can just screen share, go straight to my Bible, let y'all see exactly what I'm reading and what I'm saying. And then I can go right back to the uh, video. Uh, it, I can go back and forth at the click of a button. It's just better. Plus the Zoom meetings, it's a better togetherness. Everybody can see each other. If anyone wants to ask a question, you can, you can if you don't want to ask it, you know, audibly, you know, which you can do on Zoom, uh, plus, if you're worried about, you know, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, my video on there uh, all the time, you don't, you can turn your video off. You can see everybody else and they can't, they won't be able to see you. But it's better if you can, you know, you, you get dressed for church to go to church. You surely you can get dressed enough. It can be casual on Zoom. Uh, so, um, uh, my my meetings that I have in the Dominican Republic on Monday night Zoom meetings, I ask our our pastors to at least dress with a shirt and tie. You know, I just think ministers are to look like ministers. You know, they're examples to the people, and um, I used to <laughs> I used to have a pastor years ago, and before I found the body. Brother C.T. Gray in San Antonio, Texas. He mowed his grass in a shirt and tie. I mean, it's, I, I don't know if I ever saw him without a shirt and tie on. 
it doesn't matter what he was doing. He wore a shirt and tie. You know, he, he dressed the part of a pastor. I'm not quite that uh, direct about it. Or uh, uh, Anyway, uh, I do want us to go to Zoom meetings on Thursday nights at 7 o'clock. So, all right, God bless everybody. Uh, I've given enough time for everyone to be here. Uh, Daniel 9, verse 1. It says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Let me say something about that right now. Uh, you know, God did uh, have the prophet Jeremiah to prophesy that Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom, would be overthrown by Babylon, by Nebuchadnezzar, and that they would go under captivity for 70 years. Now, God warned them. He warned them for years. He he dealt with them. He, he pleaded with them to, to get back to serving him and being obedient to the word of God, but they just absolutely would not heed his warning. God was very patient. The reason I want to read this today is because I think this parallels to an extent for sure the, the, the world we're living in today. Um, you know, even though we're not under a dragon power of uh, captivity or slavery like they were in, 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 in Jeremiah's day, uh, we're still living in a very corrupt world. And primarily, I'm my primary concern is the United States of America. Our, our nation has forgot God. Our nation's turned against, uh, not, you know, well, they truly they've turned against God. This nation, as well as other nations in the world, but America, I think God requires more of America than any other nation because God done more in America. I believe America is the, is the nation that God chose to restore his church in. Um, you know, the, the Reformation uh, uh, began years ago. Uh, you might say its early start was with Martin Luther when he posted his 95 theses on the Wittenberg, uh, Germany uh, cathedral door of the 95 things that he saw that was uh, in era that the Catholic Church was doing. It it framed and started the uh, what is known as the Protestant movement. That word Protestant means protesters. It means protesters against Catholicism, against what these 95 things were is how it started out that Martin Luther uh, itemized. Um, and, and then, of course, the, the it was God that did that. Martin Luther was a monk in the Catholic Church. Uh, it took me quite a while to not only recognize, but to admit the fact that uh, these early reformers came right out of the Catholic Church, that God was in the Catholic Church. In fact, if you understand this, that's all God had to work with. The Catholic Church ruled the world for 1260 years from AD 538 to 1798 when uh, the French general uh, put the Pope in prison and stopped his reign in 1798. And, uh, but, but of course, that overlapped 
uh, the time of the Reformation. In fact, it was uh, it was 1539. There was always men. There were men like Huss, uh, Wycliffe, uh, Tyndale, other men in you know in the Catholic Church that uh, were early reformers, but they never did gain the strength that God gave Martin Luther. It was just God's timing, um, and uh, but. I think it was 1517 when Martin Luther posted his theses on the Wittenberg Germany door. Uh, but it was it, in 1539, King Henry VIII proclaimed himself to be the head of the body of, of England, Britain. And, and uh, he, he marched out of the Catholic Church and claimed himself to be the head of the, the church uh, and the Catholic Church didn't do anything about that right quit right away. Um, they had had men and nations rise up against them several times, but they were patient enough. They'd just wait until they had the uh, the best time to bring that nation back under their thumb and under their domain. Uh, but when when King Henry VIII pulled out, uh, that was a major event. And then in 1543, the Catholic Church realized we gotta do something about this. This Reformation was really beginning to take hold so with the Jesuit ministry, they started what they called the Anti-Reformation Movement. And so I put that date, 1543, as being when the Reformation was actually established. When the Catholic Church got serious enough to start an Anti-Reformation Movement, uh, that tells me that that it was it was established well enough they were going to have to do something about it, and so <clears throat> uh, you know after Martin Luther, John, and Charles Wesley, which the Methodist Church formed out of the Wesleyan movement, but those two brothers began to preach sanctification. Martin Luther's main message that he <clears throat> stirred the world up with was that the just shall live by faith. That they, they could pray to God. They didn't have to go to a priest or anyone uh, to confess their sins. They didn't have to go to confession, but they through faith could pray to God in heaven and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that started a personal relationship with Jesus through faith and a uh, revival began to break out all over the world. But John and Charles Wesley realized we need more than just faith. They realized that sanctification means to, to be sanctified is to be set apart for God's purpose, for God's calling on your life. And so um, they began to preach, you know, it's going to take more than faith. You, you, you got to come out from among the world and be ye separate and uh, serve God with a dedication. You got to be righteous. You got to live a righteous life. You can't live like the world, act like the world, look like the world, or you're going to be a part of the world. But it takes something more than that. When you look at the New Testament, you realize these people lived a dedicated life and they were followers of Jesus Christ and his behavior, uh, his mannerism, his righteousness, which was the righteousness of his father, God, our father also. And so 
the the Reformation, God just began, in other words, it was little by little and line on line. God just began to stir up men, reformers, <clears throat> and begin to show that where that the Catholic Church had missed it. And, uh, you know, not only did they realize that they needed uh, sanctification, but they also... You know, the Anabaptists realized that water baptism in the New Testament was more than being sprinkled that the Catholic Church was doing. And that you couldn't be sprink you couldn't sprinkle little babies and call them cause them to be bab baptized. But the word baptism, they understood it meant to be buried. There's a picture in water baptism that's required of God. You have to be born of God. You have to be baptized. The doctrine of baptisms, uh, Paul mentioned in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, uh, it, it includes water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism, and fire baptism. Three baptisms that the New Testament teaches us and helps us to understand. Water baptism, Peter said, is not it's an answer of a good conscience towards God not the putting away of the flesh so you can't get rid of the water baptism will not help you uh, it will not cause you to get rid of the works of the flesh but it does give you an answer of a good conscience towards God by obedience obeying the New Testament that you, everyone needs to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's a different baptism. And uh, uh, I believe it's in Luke, the 12th chapter of Luke. Let me just look right here in my Bible. I believe it's the 49th verse. 50th verse where Jesus said uh, here he said uh, in 49 says I am come to send fire on the earth and what will I if it be already kindled but I have a baptism to be baptized with and how shall I be straightened till it be accomplished in other words, here Jesus, he came to this earth, took on the form of a human. He was born of God. He had the Holy Ghost. He, had, he was born of God's nature, the Spirit of God, as a human, just like the first man, Adam. The first man, Adam, was born of God. He was a, a human. Uh, see, a lot of people don't understand this, but God... God made men and women human by nature. He gave us the ability to have a free will, to have, uh, to be able to make a decision. See, God is not interested in you being a puppet. See, a lot of people believe that you can live like the devil here on earth and die and go to heaven. And God will just make you righteous when you get there. They never stop to think that if God made you do everything right without sin, God would have to change your mind. Because who you are is what is in your mind. It's what's in your, you know, that the Bible talks about it being in your heart. It's, it's one and the same. Your heart is your mind. The heart of who you are is your mind. And if God changes your mind where well, you won't do anything wrong, you're not going to be you. I mean, you do what you do because of what's in your mind. You, Your spirit is, a, is action on thought. You get a thought in your mind, you act on it, produces a certain spirit, and that could be that could be a spirit of doing wrong. It could be a spirit of error. It could be a, a sinful a behavior. 
see? But for you to know righteousness, you're gonna to have to get that in your mind. You're gonna to have to, your mind, it's what Jeremiah said, prophesying concerning the, the, uh, when the, the new covenant. He said, in that day, I will, let's, let's read it. Might be better. Jeremiah 31, 31, I believe, is the scripture that I'm wanting. Um, it says, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. And that day that I took them by the hand, bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this covenant shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his neighbor saying, know ye the Lord or know the Lord for they shall all know me for the least of them to the greatest saith the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. He's talking about those that heed to this the new covenant, heed to Christ's message and follow him. Everyone that does that is going to know him. You're not going to have to ask somebody. I don't have to ask people in my church, do you know the Lord? I know they know him. It may be somebody new that come in from the world, but <clears throat> the people that are serving God, I know that they know the Lord. And and here's the new here's this new covenant. He says in the 33rd verse, this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. And by the way, that's talking about spiritual Israel. You and I, if you've been born of God, what was it Paul said to the Corinthians? He said, everyone that is circumcised of the flesh is not a Jew, but he that's circumcised of the heart is a Jew. Talking in the, about the new covenant. That was just a picture, the circumcision of the flesh under the law. Yes, those were natural Jews, but for us to become a part of the house of Israel, it, it takes a circumcision of the heart. And that's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's what he's saying here. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. See, that's your mind. God... He's not writing over the literal uh, organ, the heart organ. That you can't write anything on that and get anything out of it. But he's this is he's talking. He's using that as a picture. The very heart of who you are is in your is your mind. That's the life. So your life is in your heart. That's the organ that keeps you alive. But your mind is that. That is who you are. That's the very heart of who you are. And I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Uh, now, let's look at what Paul said in Hebrews 8, quoting this. Uh, he said um, in the 8th chapter of Hebrews, you have to give me a minute, my my Bible's froze up. There it is. The first covenant, it's in the seventh verse, Hebrews 8, 7. For the first covenant, if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law in their, my laws in their minds and write them in their hearts. 
and I'll be to them a God and they'll be to me a people. See, he's just quoting from Jeremiah's prophecy. And he's talking about when it says that uh, this is what he was going to do to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. If you remember that Israel uh, was a divided kingdom, the northern kingdom was, that division was under Jeroboam and Rehoboam, Solomon, uh, after Solomon. And uh, the northern kingdom was, of course, that was the 10 tribes that went under Jeroboam and the two tribes under which was Judah and Benjamin under uh, Judah. And, but when God sent them into captivity of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon for 70 years, that ended the, the, the two different nations of Israel, the visions of Israel. And when God restored them through Ezra and Nehemiah and uh Darius, this decree here. In fact, later, uh, who Artaxerxes made a decree and freed all of them, all the Jews, to go back home and to rebuild the temple. So, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, so this new covenant. That, that's what took place. Jesus brought about the new covenant. And um, uh, so, and, and that's what this, uh, the, this prayer of Daniel here, let's go back to, let's go back to Daniel 9 and, and read a little more. Um, because, but before we do, I'm, I just want to finish in, in my statement that God's not interested in you being, you know, being made to be righteous. God, listen to what Paul said in the 12th chapter of Romans when he said in the second verse, he said, uh, uh, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, it takes God, God to put these laws in your mind, in your heart and in your mind. That takes, takes, that takes God to do that, for God to make your thinking righteous. See, right now, the psalmist said, man's just a few days and full of trouble. <laughs> it's because we're all, none of us were born of the, of God. We were born of Adam, the nature of Adam, the fallen nature of man uh, after he, he fell from God. God didn't create man after that. He created Adam. And when Jesus came to this world, he became a human. But as I was saying earlier, he, he had the spirit of God. He was born of God's spirit. And, and that's why it took a virgin woman, Mary, to produce a human body for him to, to be, for God to, to uh, reduce Christ, his son, to a seed and put in that human embryo and produce another human born of God. So he had the Holy Ghost when he got here, but in God's time, he had to be baptized in water by John the Baptist. He told John, John said, well, I'm, I need to be baptized of you. He, he understood that there was another. Remember, he said, I need baptize with water under repentance, but there cometh another after me that will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. There's the other two baptisms. So John baptized with water when he went to baptize Jesus and said, I, I need to be baptized of you, Jesus said, suffer to be so right now to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had to be baptized in water because it was a command. God sent John the Baptist preaching. And in fact, the Bible says that those that refused to be baptized of, of John 
uh, how does it say it, that they refuse the counsel of God. And so uh, Jesus was baptized in water. He had the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the birth of the Spirit of God's nature. He was born to, of God's nature. He didn't have to be born again, neither did Adam. But you and I do because we weren't. We didn't come here born of God. We came here born of Adam. That's why it's necessary, like Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, meaning you must be born of the Spirit of God uh, and reconciled to God. Jesus came to do that for you and I. He came, if you remember, uh, in the 14th chapter of St. John, he told his disciples, he said, concerning the Holy Ghost, he said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. And the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he said in John 14, he said, he has been with you. See, all through the Old Testament, God had his spirit, spirit bore witness of him in the Old Testament. People, the, the Spirit of God dealt with men, but no man was born of that. Jesus said, he's been with you, but he shall be in you. Even as I am in my Father and he is in me, how? By the nature of God's, it's his Spirit, the Spirit of life, the nature of God. Jesus was born of that. God made him with that in heaven. He didn't lose that when he came to the earth. Um, but you and I have to be born of God's nature. And Jesus came to do that. After he finished the work of God and was accepted with his perfect sacrifice to God, as a lamb, our lamb, a type, slain before the foundation of the world, came to this earth, and accomplished uh, what God sent him here to do. And when he went back to heaven, God accepted that. You know, uh, everything had to be sanctified by blood in the old covenant. Well, that blood represented the Holy Ghost. It re represented the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, God's nature. And, you know, the blood of the Passover had to be applied to the door of the port. Uh, it had to be applied to the doorpost and on each side of the door of every home to keep the death angel from, uh, from taking the life of every newborn or firstborn child in that house. So your firstborn is Adam. You're born of Adam. But when Jesus, our Passover, see that Passover under Moses and in Egypt was a picture. And that picture is, it was a picture of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. That's what he was a picture of. And the blood of Jesus, which is, it's really not his red blood, but it is his Holy Ghost life. The reason God chose blood, is he, God told Moses, because the life is in the blood. See, God had blood sacrifices all through the Old Testament that were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ because all of those blood sacrifices represented the blood of Jesus or the life of God that was in Jesus. If you can get that. Yes, he, he fulfilled the natural shedding of blood, the natural dying of the body. But, and all of that came together in the spiritual fulfillment of that. And so it was really the Holy Ghost. Brother William Souders called it the white blood. The blood that made you white as snow. He called it the white blood. He used that to help people understand that the Spirit of God was the white blood. It was the spirit. It wasn't red blood. It was something different. It was the spirit of God, the birth of God's nature, his life, that when you're born of that Holy Ghost nature, that's what you're born of. 
And so when Jesus went back to heaven, when Moses got the, the first covenant of the law and God had him take an oxen and slay that oxen, put the blood in two basins and take hyssop, a hyssop plant and sprinkle out over the people and seal them in the blood of that first covenant was a picture. I doubt that, I don't know, maybe some people in the front row, there was very possibly three million people there. There was 605,000 men in the encampment around the temper, the, the tabernacle in uh, the wilderness in those four encampments on the northeast, west, northeast, south, and west side of the temple. And I, that didn't include the women and children. So how many, how many women and children were there? It's estimated there's possibly three million people in the wilderness. Well, <clears throat> uh, Look, when God sent Jesus and, well, when Moses, let me just finish that thought. When Moses sprinkled them, the congregation, he called them up before him. Well, he didn't sprinkle blood. I doubt that it actually got on anybody, but he sprinkled it out toward them as a uh, sign that they were sealed under that blood of that old covenant or the first covenant. Now, when Jesus went to heaven, and Paul deals with this in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. This sprinkling of the blood was of the new covenant was far more, you know, it, it, the efficacy was on the eternal life. Uh, the old covenant blood could not do that. He said the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. What that meant was God forgave sin under the old covenant by blood sacrifices, but every time he sinned again, you need another sacrifice. But Jesus, he gave us a sacrifice of a Holy Ghost life that when it was applied to the doorpost of our lives, when our Passover lamb died, and the blood of Jesus, that wonderful Holy Ghost life, nature of God was applied to the doorpost. You got your door covered, the door of your life. You let God in your life through a new birth. And you've been born of the very nature of the source of life, the eternal God in heaven, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what our Savior came to do. And he sprinkled us with that blood life, that Holy Ghost life. After he went back to heaven, which is a picture of the Holy of Holies. And see, he carried blood in there to get forgiveness of sins. He took, he, and then he sprinkled us on the day of Pentecost, he sprinkled mankind with that life. And God caused us to be born again. And, and so now God is working on our lives to put with this new covenant to write upon our minds and in our hearts his righteousness. God's going to, I was going to, I didn't finish quoting that in, in Romans 12 and 2, but be ye renewed by the spirit of your mind, in the spirit of your mind that you might know that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See what's acceptable to God, the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, Isaiah said, and in, in Jesus quoted it, or he didn't quote it, but he read from the scroll of Isaiah, 61st verse, uh, that the Lord has anointed me to preach 
good tidings to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted. Uh, see, God sent Jesus here uh, to bring about this new covenant that would finally work God's righteousness in our hearts. If we'll heed to God and serve him, he'll do the work, but you have to be dedicated and serve God and you've been born of God and God's gonna work on your life and develop his righteousness in your life unto what Paul called was perfection or maturity. Uh, Paul said in Hebrews five, he said that he that is, uh, how did he say that? He that is uh, a babe drinks milk, but he that's full age, so when you come of a full age of maturity in God, uh, under you will understand both and discern both good and and uh, righteousness. You'll you'll understand both good and evil. You'll shun the evil and choose the good. You'll have grown and matured to a full age in God, and so that's what we're working on in our lives. Let me get back now to, I want to go back to Daniel, the uh, ninth chapter. And I just read to you, I'm going to read it again in the second verse. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, and he would, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of, Jer of Jerusalem. Aren't you glad for men like Daniel that had they were studious? God called those men and they understand the times. They understand the plan of God and they can divulge it or, or uh, cause the people of God to understand it. Uh, anyway, so, uh, and reveal it to God's people. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't know. But Amos said, he said, God doeth nothing, but first he reveal it to him, the prophets so that they can reveal it to the peace of, people of God. All right, let's read on now. Concerning these 70 years of desolations of Jerusalem that they were in captivity in Jerusalem, I mean in, in uh, Babylon, excuse me. Verse three, and I set my face unto the Lord to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now look what he said in verse five. We have sinned and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgment. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings and our princes and our fathers, to all the people of the land. Can you feel that, saints? And you feel here's a man of God that looks at the condition of Israel and the world. And he knows the end of that 70 years is about up. You might say, well, God said, you know, it's going to last 70 years. It's going to be over. You know, there was a line prophet said it was going to only going to last two years. But he was wrong that Jeremiah was the true prophet that said it'd last 70 years. But here's a man that didn't say, well, you know, it's going to last seven years, it's going to be over. No sense in me praying about it. No, but he had a feeling from God. What his prayer was, God, this nation I'm a part of, this nation has sinned against you, committed iniquity, done wickedly, rebelled. 
departing from the precepts from thy judgments. I'm telling you, saints, the people of God are to be fearful, weeping and crying and praying to God, the supplications today, telling God, I see what's happened to our nation. I see what's happened to our world. But you see, we, this is something that is important for us to understand that we, they were, they were coming out of Babylonia's captivity. And in this prayer, you'll find out in this chapter, God begins to reveal, he sends Gabriel to Daniel and tells him and explains to him what's going to happen from the coming out of Babylon all the way to Christ's ministry and what it was going to do, the 70 weeks of Daniel. But here's a man that he's touched in his heart. He sees the condition of Israel, which is a broken, wicked, sinful, iniquitous, rebellious group of people. Don't you feel that for our nation? Don't you feel? <laughs> Can't you feel the condition of our world and our nation? It's corrupt. Our government is pitiful. It's actually shameful. We, we ought to be ashamed. I am ashamed. I'm ashamed of our nation. I'm ashamed of our leaders. I'm ashamed of our our leaders in Christianity. I'm thankful for the body of Christ, but I know we need to do better. But I'm ashamed of what Babylon's doing. I'm ashamed of what America's doing, let alone other nations. Let me read that again. Verse 5, we've sinned and have committed iniquity, done wickedly, rebelled, even departing, departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, to all the people of the land. O oh, Lord, righteous, belongeth unto thee, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, shame, disgrace, as at this day. To the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass, that they have trespassed against thee. I'm sorry, saints, but I, I, I'll have to say that I think in not too many years of the future, you're going to see something similar to this when the judgment of God comes in the end of this world to the Gentile world. And that primarily is, it's going to cover the whole world finally ending in Armageddon, but it's, it's going to hit America first. God's going to judge America because he called this nation. He called this nation and developed in this nation a the reformed the church in reforming process. Greater works has been, uh, greater, uh, more has been given to America than other nations in the form of revival, the form of God calling men. This was the greatest nation in the world. Why? Because God blessed it not because we're better than anybody else, not because we're smarter, but because the God of heaven chose this land when it was a barren land to send our forefathers here where there would be freedom of religion so that God would, 
would restore his church. It's not fully done yet, but we're we're we are in the latter times in the latter end of the Gentile world. If you don't know that, you don't know much about the Bible. And God's going to finish his work here, but he will judge. There, it's going to be like it was in Jerusalem. The, there was only a remnant that accepted Christ as the Messiah. The rest of them were anti-Christ. That was the anti-Christ spirit. Everybody tries to talk about the anti-Christ down here, that there's going to be an anti-Christ, dear Lord. There's been an anti-Christ ever since the early church. Those that John said, if you don't, uh, how did he say that? If, they do, if you do not believe and understand that Jesus came in the flesh as the Son of God, then you're anti-Christ. If you, those Jews that rejected him were anti-Christ. They were against Christ. They're still against him today. Let me tell you something. God's restoring the early church body of Christ. He's restoring the church today. When he gets it restored, <laughs> in fact, most people today are anti-Christ. They're against the body of Christ. And they will be against the restored church. This government will turn against it so fast and make your head swim because they don't understand. They're in confusion. And most Christians will turn against it because they're going to hold to their false doctrines. And they're not going to accept the truth. Just like it doesn't matter how great a movement God does. You look at what Jesus did and the miracles he did. I mean, it's just an unbelievable what he did. One time he was in a city and there was a funeral procession going right down Main Street. You know what he did? He stopped and walked over to that funeral procession and walked over to that casket where a man was laying in, dead in a casket and his mother was there. And he raised him from the dead. Jesus wasn't there in that world just to perform miracles to get people excited. He was there to manifest that there's a true God in heaven. That if you'll see the works of God that he's put in me to do so that I can get your attention and have enough influence to help you understand the plan of God, God will do that again. When the church is restored, there's going to be great, great moves of God. But people are going to come to see the miracles, but they're not going to get the message, many of them. Many of them will turn away from the message. You know, Jesus did that one time. He told a group, he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part with me. They turned and walked away. They misunderstood him. He didn't mean, except you eat my, literally eat my flesh or drink my literal blood. That was a picture of the Passover lamb. He meant, unless you are partakers of the spirit and life of God and the word of God, that's the life, anointed life of God that will go in your mind and cause you to understand God's righteousness and become a part of you. That's what he was saying. You can't have any part with me. <clears throat> Verse eight again. O oh Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. We're ashamed of what our forefathers did. I'm ashamed of my sin. I'm ashamed of my fleshly nature, what this world has become. Verse nine, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness 
though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servant, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon them. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we've sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For unto the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. Can you imagine this, saints? Here God takes, he takes all these people. He forms them in Egypt. He takes them out through 40 years of, of wilderness journeys to prove them, to, to cause them to understand that just the natural covenant of right and wrong. He makes them a great nation. He gives them the land of promise. Can you imagine the land of Canaan? He drives out. He uses them to overcome the ites and drives out all the lights and gives them the land. They become a great nation, a great, great king, King David. Of course, it wasn't God's will really for Israel to have kings. He really wanted them to have judges, but they didn't do very well with judges either. His people were so corrupt. But God builds a great nation. Solomon's temple, nothing in the world has ever matched that temple. But because of their wickedness, God destroyed it all. Burned the temple. God in heaven. Sent the people. Then he calls them back home. Calls Ezra to go back and rebuild the temple. Zerubbabel. Ezra calls Nehemiah to go back and build the walls of the city. <laughs> um, verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath God watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For we obeyed not his voice. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand that has gotten thee renowned. As at this day we have sinned, we've done wickedly. O Lord, I'm in verse 16. According to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins and from our, for our iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and the cause thy face, and cause thy face to shine upon my sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. Can't you see how the, the spiritual sanctuary has been desolate in Babylon? And we're, we're, we're at work rebuilding it but the, the stains of desolation is still there. <laughs> oh my God, incline thine ear and hear, open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name, for we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. That's one of the things every one of us are to do is we're to humble ourselves enough to admit God, it ain't because of my righteousness 
that I need you. I need you because you're merciful. It's your mercy that I'm asking for. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. O oh my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. See, here's a guy, this man's been living for God. He's got, he, he's got God's attention in this prayer, but he's admitting his sin. He's admitting that the condition he's been in because of the condition of his nation and the condition of the time and the where he's been, the people he's been with. <laughs> and what God did, God chose a wicked nation. God's going to judge the nation for what they did to Israel, but he, he allowed that nation to take them into captivity to judge his people. That's what God was interested in. He was interested in, and getting some judgment in these people so that he could get these people back under his covenant so he could finish his overall purpose and plan for eternity. Verse 21, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, and <laughs> that's something he calls him a man, <laughs> the man Gabriel, who, whom I was... I had seen in the vision at the beginning because being caused to fly swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation. See, there was a morning and an evening sacrifice in Israel. And at the time that there was supposed to be that sacrifice offered, Abram came. It's amazing how God still honored that, still wanted his people to honor it. Still want his people to recognize there's a time every morning that we should, you know, that those morning sacrifices were there to get your mind on God in the beginning of the day, and the evening sacrifice to get your mind on God at the end of the day. To keep God on your mind throughout the day, and to have God on your mind in the end of the day, so that you'd have a peaceful night that would help you prepare you for the next day where there could be a sacrifice. We should all rise every morning say, God, here's my life. Thank you for this day. Isn't that what Jesus told his disciples? Give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> yes, there's a time for the morning and evening sacrifice. And... Uh, the, uh, the evening sacrifice of Jerusalem had come in the end of, of their desolation or 70 weeks, I mean 70 years of captivity in Babylon. It was coming to an end. And here's a man that felt, he felt so deeply in his heart what God was doing in it because of what he felt. No doubt it was God dealing with him because of his, his humility towards God. Verse 22 says, and he informed me and talked with me. He said, old Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee for Thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. <laughs> and here he's going to give him the seven, what we know is the 70 weeks of Daniel, that he's going to show him, all right, now here's what's going to happen from this time of the, rest, the restoration of Ezra and Nehemiah. Here's what's going to happen. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people 
and upon thy holy mountain to finish the transgression and make the end of sins and make reconciliation for iniquity and bring everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. There is six, or you might even count, count it, seven things that these 70 weeks are going to accomplish. Let's look at it again, verse 24. It's to make an end of sins. That 70 weeks when Jesus came, that he would accomplish something that would could end sin in the person's life. It ended it in his. He became righteous. He became a full age. He became perfect or of maturity, sinless. End sins, number one. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Jesus came to reconcile man back to God and do away with the iniquity that was in man to bring everlasting righteousness. Think about it. Everlasting righteousness. It's not righteousness where you ask God to forgive you today and you sin tomorrow and you gotta ask, or you sin later today, you gotta ask God to forgive you again, but righteousness that lasts forever. There is no more sin. To make reconciliation for iniquity and bring everlasting right, to seal up the vision and prophecy. See, the prophets of the old that prophesied of the coming of Christ and to give the vision of what God's purpose was, that men could envision it, men like Jeremiah that prophesied of it. Men like Isaiah that prophesied over and over of the coming of Christ and what it was going to do. The prophecies of the Psalms. And to anoint the most holy, the head of the body that God gave us those six things. If you want to make the vision and prophecy, prophecy an extra, that's seven. That would be accomplished in those 70 weeks that would finally bring about the new covenant by the end of the 70 weeks. Verse 25, now therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. That's Jesus Christ. Shall be 70 weeks. Shall be seven weeks. So here's three times broken down here. Seven weeks. That was the 49 years. These weeks, by the way, the, there's a day for a year. These 70 weeks is 490 years. It's a day for uh, um, uh, uh, a uh, year for a day. So 70 weeks, 70 times seven days is 490, and that's 490 prophetical weeks, prophetical days, prophetical years is 490 years. <laughs> So there'd be seven weeks, that was 49 years, and that was the, I'm, I'm going to go over this a lot more probably later, maybe before long, maybe Thursday night, I don't know. Almost want to do it in a church service when everybody's there. Those 49 years was the restoration, the reconciliation by the restoration of Ezra and Nehemiah, the natural temple. And then there's three score and two weeks. <clears throat> That's uh, 62 weeks. And uh, that takes you to the anointing of Jesus, the beginning of his ministry. The street will be built again. 
and the wall, even in troublesome times. Now that, that he, he's going back there and showing that the street would be built again the way of Jerusalem and the wall of the city. He, that was Ezra and Nehemiah's day, even in troublesome times. It was very troublesome. They had to build with a trial in one hand and a sword in the other. Verse 26, and there, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. <laughs> but not for himself and, and the people of the prince. See, after three score and two weeks, the Messiah would be cut off. In other words, he would be crucified. Um, not of himself, but for the, it be for the people, but, and the people of the prince. Now that prince there is talking about the leadership of Rome that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This is talking about AD 70. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And at the end of the war desolations are determined. <clears throat> they bring a destruction. And he shall confirm the covenant. Well, I mean, it pointed toward AD 70. It's not AD 70 was part of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Verse 27 here says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That was during Jesus' ministry. The three and a half year that was the midst of the week it's talking about. Jesus is three and a half years of his ministry when he was teaching his disciples and with them in that, in that ministry. Can you imagine what he accomplished in three and a half years? I, I'm almost ashamed that I've been preaching and been called of God for 43, well, I don't want to see, 50, Fifty-three years, maybe, when God called me to preach. Fifty-three years ago, Jesus accomplished all this in three and a half years. And He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, He shall cause a sacrifice. See, that's three and a half years. And the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Even unto the con consummation of the determined, of that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. The, uh, so there's three time frames here. There's, uh, how, what scripture is that? It'll be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and one week. So those are the three time frames that are given there, which is the 490 years of the 70 weeks of Daniel that ended with the, uh, the stoning of Stephen the other half week. So I'll go over... I'll, I'll, I'll go over that part more clear. I don't have time to continue here today, but I mainly just wanted you to, I wanted you to compare the time frame of Daniel. It, you ought to be able to feel where we're at today and the condition of our world and how much of God's mercy and grace we need to finish this work of God. Daniel was a man that understood the times. I thank God for the men of God that understand the time that we're living in and can reveal it to the people and help the people understand where we're at. God's going to finish this work and it'll be cut short in righteousness just like it was in the early church. God's doing a great work today for those that are awake, those that are aware of what God's doing. 
I love this work. I love being a part of what God's doing. I don't know what I, well, if I was a part of the world, I'd be blind and I wouldn't know what's going on, just like many in the world are, are suffering the blindness, the spiritual blindness that's going on, the wickedness that's in this world. Anyway, pray. Let's, let's pray that God would keep helping us. Because look, saints, I'm not just showing you, you know, there's a great end to this, just like there was a great end to this 70 weeks that finished a work among a wonderful people that turned to God. There's a great end to it that hasn't been revealed yet. This was just the beginning of a man seeing what was going to happen in 490 years that God was going to reconcile man to himself and that there would be men that would stand on the face of the earth and be developed in the righteousness of God, the everlasting righteousness of God. Mm. And there's a church in a restoration process that's going to bring about a restored church, a church just like the early church. That early covenant will come back into full existence and accomplish what it accomplished among the people of God in the body of Christ, Jesus himself being the head of that body. My Lord, saints, there's something great that's coming. We may be in a desolate condition today, you know, um, that, you know, this refers to what, what Matthew, uh, G Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 when he said when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by the Daniel prophet that by Daniel the prophet he, he was talking about uh, the desolation that was going to take back there God destroyed the temple back there uh, in Luke uh, 21, how did he say it? He said, uh, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. He's talking about maybe 70 when Rome, Rome, the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem, destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. The people of God were had to flee to the mountains couldn't turn back this great desolation that took a place back then in the end of that Jewish world but before that took place God came through Jesus Christ his son and finished his his covenant and his work among whosoever will let him come and drink of the water life freely God accomplished that back there and he's going to accomplish it down here keep serving him don't turn back you've come too far to turn back now keep serving God keep your faith in him stay dedicated you're living in a wonderful time it may be like Ezra and Nehemiah's time when it said even in the troublous times we're in trouble troublous times that's how he spelt that back there T-R-O-U-B-L-O-U-S not troublesome trouble us it's <laughs> it's written in Daniel troublous times we're in troublous times but 
God's righteousness. Look, let's look again at what, is, this is, what it accomplished in the early church and it's going to accomplish it down here. Finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. Make reconciliation for iniquity. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up the vision and the prophecies. And anoint the most holy our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was the anointed. That's what Christ means, the anointed one. That 70 weeks accomplished that, and it's going to be accomplished again in the restored church. Praise God. Well, I hope that you can feel God today. I hope you feel something in this message, in this wonderful ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. I can feel Daniel's heart and I can feel this prophecy worked back there in the early church and I feel it working in me. I feel it working in our day. The likeness of it, the similarity of it, the restored church will have the very similarity of all of these things being accomplished again in the people of God. All right, God bless your heart. Uh, we had the reason that we did not have church today is because we had we had four we had four funerals that were connected with this church yesterday. Brother Sister Durham's nephew in Springfield, Brother Mark Boyd's, uh, what was that to him? Maybe a second cousin by marriage. Uh, uh, Sister Karen Davis used to be Dan Boyd's wife, her son, their son, 27 years old. No, no. Yes, 27 years old. He was actually murdered. A man got in an argument. Uh, I don't think he, I don't, there wasn't much of an argument to this man just attacked him and uh, caused a, a, a Damage to his head. He had a brain bleed, an aneurysm. Killed him before he could. They could save him. Sister Drum's uh, nephew was found. He died in his home alone. His mother found him there. That funeral took place yesterday. Both those boys' funerals took place yesterday in Springfield, Missouri. Sister Theory's brother died with an aneurysm. Uh, she's at his funeral today. Brother Phil Fisher and Sister Chelsea, uh, her grandfather passed away. And they're, uh, they're gone to his, they were at his funeral, to, uh, his viewing today and funeral to yesterday and uh, no today and funeral I think later today. Uh, Anyway, we had over 30, we had, in fact, we've already found out that there were people that were exposed to, to, to Corona virus uh, in one of these funerals and no doubt probably more than that because Corona is very high right now in Missouri and Arkansas. That's why I'm warning everybody, stay out of these crowds as much as you possibly can just because you've been vaccinated. There's people with vaccines, vaccination that, you know, you're only uh, supposed to be 95% covered with the vaccines. If you're 55 or 65 and older, after six months, your efficacy drops down to 84%, I'm reading. Uh, but even if you've been vaccinated and you come in contact with somebody with COVID, you can transfer it to somebody else and not get it yourself. So we have to be mindful of others. We need to be careful. Um, anyway, there was 30 some odd people, almost maybe 40 people going to be missing church today. So pray for those families of those funerals, the, the families and their losses. Uh, I hear brother, uh, sister Susan 
Weaver, I'm told, has got COVID. And, of course, Brother Weaver's worried that he's going to catch it. Um, we need to be praying for our people right now. Sister uh, Crow was in the hospital yesterday, but she's home. She went home today. Uh, uh, oh, yes, Michael and Cindy, uh, who are taking care of Cindy's mother, Sister Angie Elder. She's really in need of our prayers today. She's having terrible chest pains. Uh, and uh, she's been up almost all night. She's just not doing well at all. Please pray for her, Michael and Cindy. I know, appreciate you praying for them. God would give them wisdom and help them to know the best way to care for Sister Angie Elder, Cindy's mother. Uh, Brother Bill Daniels, I don't wanna leave him off. I'm asking God to touch Brother Daniels. I mentioned Sister Crow, she is home but let's keep praying for her because she's not, you know, they're trying to get people out of the hospital. They won't keep you very long at all. And if they even have room to keep you at all. Uh, so she did go in yesterday and she's, they've already took her back home, but she still needs our prayers and she's still not over her episode altogether. Um, I know there's other needs and I just, you know, pray for all of God's people in the body of Christ and, and for the needs that you know of. God bless your hearts. I, I love all of you. I love the word of God and I love the people of God. Uh, God bless your hearts. If you would just bow your head and pray with me right now. Dear God, Oh, Lord, I know you know our needs. I know you know our concerns concerning your people that are sick in their bodies, need your touch on their lives. These families with these lost loved ones here just recent, Lord God, comfort these families, comfort these mothers and fathers and uh, family members that have endured these losses of life in their family. Oh, God, these that are sick in their body, Sister Angie Elder, God, touch her today in a special way. Oh, God, help help uh, Michael and Cindy. Give them wisdom, God. Help them, oh, Lord, as they care for Sister Elder. Elder. Give them wisdom, Lord. Brother Bill Daniels, God, touch his body today. Help him, Lord, with this condition. God, uh, Sister Crow, would you touch her and help her today, Lord, and help her get over this infection in her body and the pneumonia that she has. Brother and Sister Weaver, Lord, God, touch them and protect them. Protect Brother Weaver. Help Sister Weaver to get over this, this virus, this pandemic that we're under. All of your people, Lord God, we just... I ask you to reach out and touch them, Lord. I know that there's other needs in our assembly. I won't mention them all, but we just ask you, Lord, for your, your great grace and your mercy, your touch, oh God. We give you praise today. Thank you for your goodness to us. Oh, thank you, Lord God. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, I want to mention uh, Sister Karen Davis, the mother of this young man, the Boyd family that lost her son, Sister Mary, uh, Sister Laura Durham's sister, Mary, her sister, her sister's name is Mary, the loss of her son, Sister Theory, the loss of her brother, Sister Chelsea, the loss of her grandfather. God, oh God, touch each one, Lord. Just want to mention them. Help me to keep them in our prayers as God comforts their hearts. And God touches these that have, have need in their bodies in such a, such a great way, we pray. All right, God bless all of you. Have a good day. I will see you in a, uh, on Thursday night. Let me mention this before I close. Please, everyone, download 
the Zoom app, Z-O-O-M, either on, if you've got an Android phone, uh, download that app or, or an Android tablet. Uh, or if you've got a regular computer, you can download it on Microsoft's. Uh, you can go to their uh, app uh, station and download it from them. They're on every one of these platforms. Or if you have an iPhone, you can download Zoom from them. And let me look here. I'm going to give you uh, uh, let's see how we do this here. Hold on. Okay, I'm going to give you the meeting ID. This is my personal meeting room for every Zoom meeting that I have. That meeting ID is 462-780. 9399. I'll give that to you again. I'll give you a minute here to get you a pen and paper because Thursday night we're going to have a Zoom meeting and I want you to have your app. And all you got to do is click on that app and hit join the meeting and put in this meeting ID and you'll, you'll automatically be. Now, when you first put this in, you may not get in right away because the person hosting the meeting, which is me, will have to click on admit to admit you in. Not just anybody can get in here. You got to be admitted. So you're my special guest, every one of you. The meeting ID is 462-780-9399. We will not put that on our Facebook or anywhere where just anybody can see it. Those are under the sound of my voice today. You can hear it. And uh, that will be our Zoom meeting Thursday night. Um, you can dress casual. You can click on your video to turn it off. If, you know, if you're in your pajamas, just go ahead and turn it off. I'm not interested in you being on there on video. But you get, you do get dressed for church. Surely you can get dressed for a Zoom meeting. You know, it doesn't. You don't. You don't have to look. You know. I do want my ministers to have on a shirt and tie. I'd appreciate it if you would. Uh, we're the examples to the people of God. I think we ought to address the part of a minister. So um, other than that, the rest of you can dress casual. I love all of you. God bless you. One more time, the meeting ID for Zoom next week is 462-780-9399. And this is for the people that is under my ministry or that would like to be a, a part. I'm, I do not want you giving this out to people that you know are against, you know, the body of Christ or against me or our church. Don't do that. If you do, I will limit it to passwords and, because I'm not going to tolerate a bunch of gainsaying foolishness. Uh, I'm not here to fight. We're not in the fighting business. We're in the righteous business of the body of Jesus Christ. So please heed to that. God bless you all. Uh, I'll see you Thursday night at seven o'clock on Zoom. Did I give you the one more time you want it? 462-780-9399. Almost anybody in the Little Rock Church has got that ID. If you didn't get it, contact me or someone in our church. And we'll give it to you. God bless all of you. Have a good day the rest of this day. And I will see you Thursday night on Zoom. God bless and have a good night.